1996, I was contracted by the federal U.S. government for a special bioweapons project. I was tasked with providing animal carcasses to be used in field testing. This involved me regularly driving out of state to collect them. I will not say where I was contracted from, due to the nature of what tests were for, but I will say that it's classified U.S. government work, and they knew everything about my life, even before they contracted me, due to my extensive background. As I said already, it was my job to provide the animal carcasses, and I even had a private supplier who I got them from. It was a local rancher. Now, this rancher was very secretive about where they came from, but it's not hard to guess because coyote pelts and other animal prices go for excellent prices. But, all jokes aside, he called me with a special task. Apparently, he had gotten shipped crates of live specimens, specifically cryptids that I had to move back and forth between facility to facility. It was my job for this. This became commonplace for me for quite some time before the rancher had a bullet put in his head for disrupting protocol. Not my call, but it's something you have to deal with in this line of business. Apparently, he was a massive liability and risked exposure to the projects that we were involved in. I was then moved and stationed to a small underground base in Wyoming, in which I would still continue my work on the bioweapons project. We primarily focused on splicing and interchanging DNA. We're talking about matching specific sequences of genetic coding for certain sequences that had already been determined. We were looking to see what kind of poisonous substances we could artificially create and splice into the genomes of other well-known animals. It was a pretty nefarious project, sinister to say the least. The goal was to come out with something like that of a living weapon, a super poison dart frog, or other animals similar to that that we can enact on the enemy, gain intel, and whatever it is else we needed. Then, in 2001, shortly after 9-11, we had a brand new contract. The U.S. military was going to war in Afghanistan, and they were going to do it with a special serum. For most of us on the project, this was our first exposure to biowarfare work, at least to this degree. I had been okay with what we were doing up until this point, but when I heard about the new assignment, my stomach turned upside down. They were taking it one step further. All it took was one meeting, where they unveiled the plan for me to realize that a mistake had been made somewhere along the line. Sure, we were already artificially creating super poisons, diseases and other extremely dangerous pathogens, but this was on a different level. They had really pushed for us to use live human experiments and began scrambling their DNA coding. We were under strict contract and had to follow through with our assignment. I wasn't about to be a part of this. I was pretty vocal in my opposition, and they were vocal about my disposal, and how I was very expendable for the project. We had come to some sort of an agreement. I would be taken off the team and moved into a different sector. But in all actuality, I was actually kicked off the team and removed, blacklisted, so to speak. I was placed on watch forced to sign multiple NDAs and told if I were to ever speak a word of this, I would not live to see another day. Now that it's been 20 plus years since this all occurred, I feel now might be the time to open up. After all, after battling with stage 4 cancer, I know I don't have too much longer left to live anyway. If they were to come after me for releasing the little bit of information I've given you, what gives? I'm a dead man already, and I could assure you that as time goes on, and with COVID rampaging the earth, you're going to have a lot of older gentlemen like me come out of the woodworks, talk about all the heinous projects they had worked on in their lifetime. I guarantee it. Many of us live with the guilt of things we had to bear witness to, and we could not hold it in any longer. My colleagues and I have worked hand-in-hand -hand with entities from the ethereal planes for well over a decade. In my 20s, I served as an infantry marine in Somalia, then moved on to work for the government, involving tech that would make people weightless. But it wasn't until I was selected by a secret government organization of academics, researchers and engineers to take part in experiments with large-scale applications of levitation technology that really 
anything noteworthy would happen. Some years ago, you might remember hearing rumors going around about a flying man spotted over Mexico City. Although this story eventually became well known publicly, thanks to reporters, I was aware of it months before it ever became popular, or should I say the experimentation of it. Before the Mexican sighting, my colleague and I were both involved in reverse engineering experiments with a number of third-party entities who will not be named who had also been assigned to help us better understand how their technology worked. In short, our research was focused on finding out why they could levitate so well when ours never performed as planned. We were always being told what we would have to cross the streams in order for any significant results to be achieved. But we didn't know what this meant until one day when a disc-shaped craft landed in our own base. We engaged with four ethereal beings. In the process, they killed several of my colleagues. These entities refused to work with us and sought our demise. They were incredibly hostile. Bud was told later on that these beings were somehow handled by the secret organization. Now that you're up to speed on my current projects, we are currently doing advanced DNA testing. Of the kind, I can't really talk about or divulge into the details. I'll just summarize and say that we are currently working on harnessing the power of different forms of energy. Forms of energy that this plane of existence has no idea even exists. And we are working with these beings to harness said energy. I was corporal in the Marine Corps, stationed at the U.S. Naval Academy. This was at the beginning of my second year when I was assigned to an unnamed project that was given the utmost highest priority. This meant that everything else had to go on hold until this project got its act together, which is why I had never gone home for Thanksgiving. It would have interfered with our deadlines to get this project moving forward. The brass did not care if you were still a student, as long as you showed up every day and did what they were asked of you, even though I continued to go into class for the first semester, even while working on Capitol Hill. Thus, while others spent time with their families during the holidays, I was working. It did make for some good stories over the years, though. The project was basically a research program to determine what happened on reported sightings on UFOs and possible abduction cases. We were told not to focus on the more sensational events. Rather, look at all aspects that could be considered ordinary or even mundane. This would help us better understand how these beings interacted with us if they existed outside our realm of understanding. The first interesting thing that I observed during my time there is our supervisors knew way more about the subject than they were letting on, which either meant they were lying or somehow involved in very bizarre activities not listed in their official description. For instance, one day, we had an unusual sighting over Baltimore involving a large fireball that was witnessed by both ground and airborne traffic. Someone found out that I had family in the area, asking me what they saw, then began to grow angry when I said my family never called me with this news of the event. The other weird thing is that our supervisors thought it was a good idea to have us work closely with these people. We might learn something from them. But at no time did they ever share information gained from these interactions, which made no sense, considering how much money the U.S. government spent on this project. The strangest thing I observed while working there involved one of the study participants who came to us voluntarily after her second abduction experience. She wanted answers about what had happened to her, even if it meant going up against everything she believed in up to that point. These people were told that there would be no memory of their abduction experience. This was for their own good. The woman I mentioned above said she remembered everything, which included seeing several beings on her farm doing something with her cows. Nothing about what she had experienced made sense, considering about what we knew about these beings, after observing them for almost 20 years by then. And when they realized things had gotten out of hand, our supervisors decided it was time to make contact. We started out like a diplomatic visit, but ended with all three of them, myself not included, being subjected to an unknown liquid until they passed out. Next, 
our supervisors returned to work, but were no longer allowed to interact with our study participants. So this woman was stuck out without answers about her abduction experiences. We also had intelligence on strange alien beings, and so little time to explore and understand it all with very limited resources. I was glad to leave this project behind me after my first year, but felt obligated to go back the following year because I need more conclusive evidence that these beings were indeed out there, which only drew the ire of my fellow students who tried convincing me not to waste any more time on what they deemed a futile effort. Fortunately for me, 11 months of non-activity of the project convinced our supervisors that I needed another assignment. Long story short, I won't waste your time with irrelevant details, but the project is still ever going, and they are still working with human abductions and non-human entities. July of 1984. I was a sergeant stationed up in Maine in the Army. I was in charge of a very small unit, guarding an airstrip. We would go out on patrol every morning and night, but never had anything out of the ordinary to report. I was pretty sure my unit was there as a form of punishment. The airstrip is surrounded by woods. We'd see evidence of people going in and out, but never had to report seeing anybody. Regardless, we were told to strictly patrol the perimeter. So, one July night... A new guy that had just been assigned came up to me while we were standing guard at dusk and told me he saw something very strange. He claims he saw what looked like a woman with long dark hair, wandering and walking off in some trees across from where we were posted. As we watched her, he realized that she didn't have a face, just a blank space. I told him to write up his report. We'd send it in through the chain of command but something made me doubt what he had seen, so I went out there to take a look for myself. One thing is I've always been good at sensing when something doesn't seem right. As I walked out towards those trees, my senses got stronger and stronger that there was definitely something wrong going on. The closer I got, the less safe I felt. I reached the spot where my soldier said he saw her standing. It became very clear that this was not a person at all, but some strange creature, it taking the form of a human. As I gazed through my rifle scope, I could tell that she or it was unnaturally hunched over and slightly misshapen. Its skin seemed to have a strange texture. Even though it was dark, the moonlight shined and glistened off the body in a way that looked unnatural. She or it turned to me and ran on all fours in my direction. I fired a shot, and as soon as the bullet pierced through her body, she disintegrated, like shooting dust. I myself immediately reported what I had seen, but as soon as it got up in the chain of command, I was scolded and corrected for my behavior. The information would be refused to be passed up higher, and since I have connections with people on that base still, and people talk, I'm told that there is a lab underneath that base where they run not-so-ethical experiments. Apparently, several of them have gotten out or were doing field testing. That's perhaps just what I saw that evening. A 2000 is when this happened. The story still remains classified as top secret by the government, but recently released documents state that this incident that occurred in 2000 off of San Diego's coast when several sailors on the Zodiac boat saw what they described as two fish-like beings. The sailors were part of a special unit conducting classified operations in the area at the time. We were on a dark-of-the-moon mission, some 50 miles off of San Diego, when an extremely bright light illuminated our boat, stated one of the officers involved in the briefing back in 2000. The light was so bright and intense, all I could see was a silhouette, of the three other men on the boat with me. We were all bathed in this unearthly glow. There was also a long structure beneath it, like a fin or a dorsal fin, which is common on military vessels, but it had an unusual protrusion coming up from the top. He then went into more detail. Whatever the object was, it was either ejected or dropped or something into the water, and immediately it began to rise toward our position. 
said one naval officer who has seen classified photos and videos of the encounter. He described the object as having an elongated, burnished gold tone, with the portion above water having three main prongs that looked almost like arms extending upward, similar to what many people think of when they visualize a classic depiction of a mermaid. The object or being seemed to stabilize. They were not able to tell if whatever it was was mechanical or biological. While this was occurring, our boat began turning away from this thing and began maneuvering at high speeds. The thing accelerated with such incredible speed and agility. All I could do was watch in amazement. He called it an advanced technology beyond anything known on Earth. When you see something like this, and you're faced with the prospect of never being able to prove to anybody what it is you saw, because all you have left is your word against the governments, something that not everybody will believe anyway, I can assure you there is a very strong emotional component involved. Talking into consideration the speeds we observed and how quickly it changed direction, if that thing had been a craft underwater operated by another entity other than the United States military unit, I would say, with equivocation, we were looking at an extraterrestrial craft. But as much as we want to believe in aliens and UFOs, the thing in question seemed more biological than anything else. The sailors who feared retribution for talking about what they saw were told to keep quiet by the U.S. Navy. However, the boat videotaped the events, and one of these tapes shows up in a video leaked anonymously several years ago. The tape has been made public, but only recently released documents state that the incident occurred in 2000. My name is Vega. I work at an undisclosed site in the desert, recently acquired by the Unusual Incidents Unit of the FBI. The facility was recently used to house detainees of war from Afghanistan and Iraq until it was decommissioned months ago due to renovation projects being completed elsewhere within the base. One project housed underground serves as a geomagnetic array to study fluctuations in the Earth's electromagnetic fielding. Another building is a state-of-the-art supercomputing facility that can store and process exabytes of data from all around the world. I was employed in this unit as a communication specialist for almost two years before being assigned to this very specific site. This is where I am tasked with handling emergency calls from nearby towns. In addition to providing security for the base itself, all responders have been equipped with high-definition cameras on their helmets and bodies. They could provide real-time visuals from any response area back to our dispatch center here within the base. We had been alerted that there had been multiple reports of supernatural events occurring early in the morning near Rockwell Pass, just outside of town. My supervisor authorized my presence on the initial response team. I was present for a total of five encounters. The first four were fairly ordinary cases of hysteria among civilian populace, but the fifth encounter changed everything we have come to believe about how most people view the world. When our responders arrived at the scene, they found a man naked, except for a pair of underwear standing in front of an older model Mazda sedan smashed into a massive boulder on the side of the road. According to witnesses, which included other motorists who had stopped to assist him after seeing him run nearly nude down Highway 191 at high speed, he seemed confused and frightened by his surroundings. He refused any assistance from any party until responders had arrived. He almost immediately relaxed and seemed calm after that. He informed responders that he had been attacked by a man and a woman when in custody. The man acted stranger than we could imagine and informed us he was actually not of this planet. Before thinking he was crazy and sent him off, he told us some very sensitive intel that only few people in this branch could know about. How he knew about this, we weren't sure. After bringing him in for questioning, he showed us something. He used the sharp object and cut his arm open. Out came this black liquid, which was not like blood, but thicker. He then explained that he had been sent into the human populace to try and blend in and merge, all for the purpose of gathering intel. From there, and from what I was told, 
He was passed further down the line, if you understand what I mean. So I was not able to catch any more of what happened to him, or what they did. But things like this happen in my line of work far often than not. You'd be surprised. Maybe I'll share more details with you in a future email. For now, I'll keep things short and to the point. Thank you. Two thousand three. An anonymous military officer has agreed to come forth with a detailed eyewitness experience about seeing strange wolf like creatures outside of the military base he was stationed at. The officer involved wishes to remain anonymous, but has allowed himself to be named as Major C for confidentiality purposes. Being a higher ranking officer in the United States military is enough of a pull on its own just to get people interested in the story. Major C was serving in an undisclosed northern Louisiana base when one night something happened. He firmly believes that this event should not hold any national security implications and believes everybody should know what is really going on out there. He claims One night, I was doing rounds around the exterior of the base, going on my perimeter. I didn't have a partner with me. I wouldn't usually do this, but for some reason, I felt more on edge that evening than I had the previous evenings, and I wasn't sure why. He went on to say, I can't really explain why I suddenly felt the overwhelming need to do this, to try and hurry my patrol along, but something told me, my gut instinct, that I was in danger. Major C then goes on to say he was not expecting anything out of the usual or out of the ordinary during his time, but most certainly had not anticipated what he saw next. He continued, As I'm doing my patrol, outside one building in particular, which was a storage facility for all kinds of weapons and ammunition, something had caught my eye. I had seen some kind of being there in the dark, not really sure what it was, but it emitted a noise that certainly did not help put my mind at ease. The most terrifying growling noises came from this, like it was really large and angry, like it was trying to intimidate me. It lasted around 30 or so seconds, but made me realize just how exposed I was. If I, if whatever it was out there, had really wanted to fight, there was nowhere I could go, nothing I could do, nowhere to hide. He finished by saying, That experience shook me up quite a bit. It'll make you think twice about being outside, especially by yourself. There has also been numerous sightings and reports of strange experimentation going on around that exact location. Some believe it all just might be one massive conspiracy, though. Major C says he wishes to remain anonymous for obvious reasons. He went on to say, I am perfectly willing to answer all your questions surrounding this experience. I simply wish to remain anonymous due to my ranking in the military. Major C lives in the United States currently but had recently returned from a tour of duty overseas and witnessing these strange events. He was deployed away from home for over three months, only returning. When asked further if he believes the military or government is involved in the creation or manipulation of these beings, he claims, They are bioweapons, created and tested by the government. I firmly believe it. It's all about money, though. The military has been trying to create super soldiers for years now, and there's no doubt in my mind they have succeeded in several iterations. When asked what he believes these creatures might be, he said, Well, first, you have to look at the old wives' tale, what many call the Rougarou. These beings that currently exist were the idea, the concept behind the creations. These superweapons or bioweapons were modeled after what already exists. They were often referred to as Banes, but many members of the squad also would refer to them as werewolves. The squad was involved in a lot of nighttime raids during our tours over there, often turning up in very odd results. In fact, the conspiracy surrounding these experiments supersede this sighting. The process of creating the perfect soldier can date back as far as the 1970s, when work on several bioweapon projects really began. These experiments and projects were approved and allowed at the highest level, meaning the top officials within government bodies must have been aware of the events, but sworn not to speak of it. 
One report detailed an incident where a squad mate was viciously mauled by one of these test subjects before being shot dead by another team member, putting him out of his misery. Government interaction with them has always been sworn in secrecy. Any intertwining of civilian casualties caused by these are quickly swept away, never being released publicly. For now, it seems as though the story behind this sighting will remain a mystery. But it's clear that something is going on at this military base. People believe it has all been covered up. The government has never admitted to dealing with any type of werewolves or bioweapons during Major C's time overseas. But the conspiracy only continues to grow. In 2009, Mr. A was contacted by a team of Russian operatives working from a base down underneath the Sahara Desert for special projects including interdimensional travel and other supernatural based projects. Mr. A was the only member of the team willing to go public with this information for fear that he would face life imprisonment or worse, if caught. He has worked within the government, and thus far is trusted when it comes to disclosing such sensitive information. He claims, Well, I had been working on a project in northern India, and we were given an order to relocate our operations to a base beneath the Sahara Desert. And two weeks later, we set up shop, and we began right away, creating a portal using magic rituals, technology, and particle accelerators all designed to bend space and time around itself, far before the famous and very public CERN. Anywho, something went wrong during the process, and we believe we opened a gateway. We were ordered to shut down the operations immediately, destroy all information and references to said project. The next morning, portions of the base were overtaken by this strange alien-like growth, Many of our men had fallen severely ill and died. Many of us who did not spend full time on the project were the only ones who managed to stay alive. I understand this sounds something like kind of a horror movie or maybe a video game. But I'll tell you, the truth is often stranger than fiction. The project was quickly ordered to close before contamination happened. And this particular facility was destroyed buried eternally beneath the sands. And since this time, I have moved my work permanently over to United States soil, where I work, and am currently contracted on other various similar projects like the one we were working on. That's about all I'll say for now. With a deep past and many things I've had my hands on, I'm here to share some information on the government's involvement with the subject of aliens. The idea that this is still being hushed by all governments, military and otherwise, is laughable. The only thing stopping the truth from coming out about aliens existing in our midst is simply because there are so many countries involved who have something to lose if they come clean. They still want to profit off it, even while it persists. It does not help that most people are slow to believe even when they can't see themselves. The trick for any government, either wanting to be seen as a hero or continue their illicit dealings with these creatures, resists in keeping the public ignorant of the whole situation, not giving them too much information at once. Thus, an elaborate disinformation campaign was created to keep people occupied with distracting lies and lies. The truth is, there has been contact with interdimensional beings, and plenty of it. However, the matter gets more complicated by the fact that these aliens are not typical. They are not like what's portrayed in Hollywood. When we first worked on several specimens in our lab, we were not entirely prepared for what we would find. It started out as simple enough. There were reports from other countries about strange lights. Well, I first, before working on anything, could not believe it. After seeing the things myself, I knew that things would change forever once the public became knowledgeable about these things. The deals were struck and human contact was made. Human lives were exchanged for the cost of alien technology for what the military and government now use in secrecy without mankind and civilians really knowing much about. A technology that would terrify you if you knew it existed. 
and there is even massive controversy within several branches of the military and U.S. government over the massive war that happened in the Dulce base in 1979. But that's enough to write a novella on. Whoever reads this, I'll let you research that rabbit hole on your own. But many of the specimens that I had worked on personally were either shipped to there or from there. Any technologies we had gained, any hybrid experimentation that went on, was ultimately sent to that base which, if you didn't know, is the primary hub for all of this, at least for my clearance and knowledge. There are several other smaller operations going on throughout the United States, all over the country. Of course, not acting to the level that that base is at, but similar in power and output. To keep myself safe, I'm going to keep this as short as I can. If you want more information, simply just try and Google some of the things I've told you about today. You can find a lot more information without me having to share too many details and risk myself becoming a true liability. In the 70s, I worked for a secret government project involving the paranormal, using special devices and complex mathematics. This was a project designed and set out to harness the power of ethereal energy, the energy that exists all around us, what we now know as dark matter. Back then, it went by several different names, but things didn't go as planned. After a few months, the project was shut down. We figured somebody had gotten to the top brass about the project. I believe it was more calculated than that. When you begin experimenting with energies on this scale, you begin to attract attention. Not always the positive kind, either. I cannot go into further detail, there are still too many who watch out for any whistleblowers of this kind of information. But I can't say that after this project was shut down. I had an experience with something on the other side of the veil. It has taken me even years to understand what happened. But I believe it was a warning for me about the dangers of tampering with forces we don't fully comprehend. I have since tried to help people afflicted by these otherworldly forces... Maybe it's my penance for working on that dreadful project. I don't want to sound like I'm crazy, and I won't put down on paper my experiences with what's beyond the veil, necessarily. That could only lead to more questions than I won't be able to answer. I will say that after my extensive work on this project, I began to have nightly visits from entities that referred to themselves as the gatekeepers. It were these beings who warned me about future experiments that would be conducted, as well as what unforeseen consequences they might have. They were demonic in nature, tormenting me every night. I think because I had a part to play in the lifting of the veil. I would wake up every morning, having been unable to sleep all night, feeling drained and exhausted, not just mentally, but emotionally. I made contact with the mysterious person in who knew about the project, was a bit higher up the chain, they claim that these beings, too, had life-threatening effects in their life, and to not communicate with them at any cost. That was not enough for me to listen. I went on to work with another project that had to do with the human psyche, and how we could all be manipulated. It kind of like psyops, but different. I think I know why this project was kept so hush-hush. It all ties together. This was also during the same time that Monarch Mind Control was heavily being operated. It is the process of basically creating an unconscious killer, so to speak. That's putting it lightly, without going into too much detail. The other projects I chose to be a part of, these entities would continue to torture me more and more. There were no breaks. It was relentless. I eventually began not going home and sleeping where I could. In the car, in the lab, wherever. After all this, if family members who I was close to began dying in strange, unknown ways over the following two years as I continued to work on failed attempts at harnessing this energy. Our equipment then was so much more primitive. We had many attempts, but many failed. I wonder if these entities that were torturing were the ones that had slipped through. Finally, in 1982, I resigned from my work and the ridiculous amount of pay to work hand-in-hand -hand with these projects. Ever since then, I've been living with these entities. Even now, I don't feel like they have ever left.
I had just turned 22 when I joined the U.S. Navy. My first choice was the Marines, but I took what they offered. Like my high school self, who had dreams of being then-President Bill Clinton, I wanted to become a Navy SEAL. At basic training in Great Lakes, the drill sergeants, all former SEALs, drilled into us that we would never succeed at becoming a SEAL. We were the dregs of the Navy, and they made sure to make our time as miserable as they could. I despised the idea that I could be no better than they were, but I was consoled by the advice given to me by an older sailor and I became friends with. Always be the hardest worker in whatever you do. My mission began when I was assigned to a special ops team in Iraq. I had my first real experience of the supernatural on one of our missions outside Baghdad. I am sworn by secrecy by my oath of loyalty, which is why I'll only ever tell you my name is Jared. We were patrolling on foot to a location where formal intelligence had told us we might find intelligence to use. The weather was terrible. We found ourselves slogging through mud and slush. The team was spread out in standard combat formation. Our boots kept sinking into the mud. I was at the rear of the unit, alongside the group's only female soldier. We were following in our footprints, but had to keep stopping as we lost sight of the team ahead of us through dense fog we were now going through. It was just me and her, as we had gotten separated from the rest of the unit. My radio was shorting out, so communication was very iffy. The fog began to grow very thick, to the point we were now overwhelmed. We kept walking, but we were completely disoriented, as we could only hear the occasional sound of other team members ahead. We began to hear screams that were not our crews, that sounded somewhat alien. Then we hear gunfire, and our own crew screaming. We were being picked off by something. I told the soldier beside me to use her radio, but it also turned out to be shorting out. I looked at my own radio. It was not working. We were now on our own, and whatever was picking off the rest of our unit was moving to us next. I could see large silhouettes moving quickly through the fog. Whatever they were doing were destroying and killing all of our troops. I took my gun and firing into the fog in the direction of where I thought they were. We both kept firing, despite it only being a few seconds. I stopped to then see the soldier next to me was now dead. I was trying hard now not to panic, despite all my training. But she was gurgling as she was dying, not dead. More screaming ensued while we were fighting off an unknown enemy. I let out a few more shots, but stopped as the fog began to now dissipate, with visibility coming back. About three-fourths of our entire team was now dead, including the female soldier I had just been with. The only other surviving members of our team who weren't seriously injured or killed was also another female soldier. We made our way back to the closest city, where we had to give a report, but not while fleeing this enveloping fog that was moving in our direction. We were taken by higher-ranking officials, explained that what we witnessed was a weapons experimentation. We were told to be silenced and not speak of this extraction under any circumstances. To this day, I've kept my silence, but now that's all changed. But the fog, it drives me crazy, what I saw in it. It was dark. It was an ordinary darkness. I believe it was alien of some kind. When I was a part of military intelligence back in 2003, I've seen some things that lead to beliefs of alien life forms having infiltrated aspects of our government establishment. In 2003, I've been to the Area 51 for a classified project where I was introduced to some terrifying things that go on during the night. While spending my nights there, I've seen the military bring in the remains of a crashed UFO. And I'm not talking about the Roswell crash. There have been many, many more since then. The more terrifying news of this discovery is that alien life forms were also partly operating below that site. The project that I was involved in revolved around alien life forms and their plans to decimate our existence using alien technology that we have recovered. Numerous UFOs have since crashed since Roswell, 
one of the aircrafts that crash landed in Stephenville, Texas. The UFOs were built using technology that is far superior than our own. This has prompted the military to build their own crafts. At first, I was hesitant about the reports, but after the UFOs from Area 51, I believe that what people have been reporting are indeed real. I wish that I had not seen what I did, but it has made me believe the possibility of extraterrestrial life even more, dominating our entire government. When I was with a group called Majestic, we were involved in recovering crafts and parts of alien origin. We would then use the technology that we had acquired and building more advanced aircrafts, still worked on to this day. I then ended my involvement in Majestic. I realized that the secrecy which we handled our projects was far too much. I left Majestic because I felt the public had more of a right to know about these life forms. I've had to do all of this in secrecy due to the overwhelming threats many women and women like me receive who wish to leak important information. I believe that someday the government will disclose what is happening, but until then, I'll do whatever it takes to get the info out there. In 2001, I served in Iraq. I heard about some strange rumors coming out of the country. The army had captured several strange things. Not necessarily ghosts or anything like that, but rather super soldiers. Being genetically engineered for the battlefield, no one, not even my friends who had worked in a research facility located in Iraq itself, would give me any more information than that. I still think back to those rumors when I'm in the middle of a firefight and wonder if what I'm fighting against is yet another super soldier from the Frankenstein labs. See, I was a part of a group called the Armor Unit, in charge of training soldiers how to use specialized equipment. The government worked with us and sent us to some really bizarre projects. We've seen some strange things, and even weirder on paper. For example, one of the pieces of equipment we were working on was a helmet that could project an image of whatever was in front of you onto its visor. It gave you thermal imaging and anything else you needed to know. From what I heard, the armor unit was actually decommissioned in 2011 due to a continued intelligence blackout that's going out through present day. I've always wondered who was really calling the shots and why they were always so paranoid about allowing information to flow freely between their lower and upper ranks. Shortly after that stopped, the flow of information between units, rumors began to circulate that there was a top secret super soldier program going on we believe another reason for this discontinuation is so that that program could continue. In 2001, shortly after 9-11, we were operating in a tiny village in the middle of nowhere when we began to be attacked by swarms of soldiers. We had no idea who they were and none of them were communicating. It was clear they wanted the village destroyed and the army unit either captured or killed. It turned into a several hour long firefight with the entire unit pinned down, and two of my fellow troopers died. And then, all of a sudden, it's like we weren't fighting against ordinary men and women. This, by the way, was a small village located in France, in a very rural section, actually where one of our US labs is located. I think these soldiers we fought against were the same ones who took part in attack on our own lab. I can't be sure. I've seen some strange things in my time, like I said, but I think this is what made me believe in the supernatural. I've been very quiet about it for a long time, but after seeing what I saw, nothing really surprises me anymore. In the time since this has happened, we pulled out of multiple secret locations, especially after they began attacking our own. I don't know what is happening, but I wanted to share my story with you. Since the armor unit has been decommissioned in 2011, and this new super soldier program has taken, I believe they're trying to go back and erase any trace of what there used to be, any trace of their old programs. To get you a little more up to speed, I'll copy and paste part of the declassified log that I kept while stationed. We've gone dark. I've lost contact with command. We've been compromised by something that we can't see, and the only thing we know is that it wants to kill us. They're invisible, except for when they attack. 
but even then it's like they disappear between movements. With how fast they are, I don't know if we are capable of stopping them. I've got a squad of soldiers with me. Most I've never seen before and none of them are in any of our files. They are not Iraqis. I have no idea who they are or where they came from. Some of them are normal looking while others are not anything human. We all have reason to believe they are actually alien life forms. I don't know why or how I'm still alive. I'll do my best to share more information. I don't work for the military anymore, but I had from 1991 all the way to 2000. I wanted to share one of the more interesting stories while I worked in the Marines. It happened during 1994. A lieutenant colonel who was a friend of mine called me over one day. He had been looking for somebody with my background and thought that I might be helpful with something he had come across which needed much detailed examination. The job was easy enough and it would not interfere with my regular workload. The lieutenant colonel offered to let me work on it spare time. I was thinking of how I could make myself look busy when he called me over to one of his assistants and told me where I'd be working. I was surprised to find out it was actually on an alien craft that had been found some time ago on a small island off of New Zealand. It had been partially buried and yet somehow encased in a black crystalline substance which I later learned was very similar to what they used on their holes, as a means of making them impervious to fire. It had been in the dirt, buried away for a long time. When they dug it out, it was almost covered in a very thick layer, which broke down into its constituent molecules in a matter of hours after being exposed to oxygen. It was clear that this stuff was self-replicating, and would continue to expand until it had completely covered the object, I thought we were going to lose the entire craft. We had taken a sample back to the lab and used some very high-powered lasers. We were able to melt and burn a very small, very thin hole in it while keeping the laser on target. The black material would rapidly reform itself, but we were able to get samples of what was underneath for analysis. We were eventually able to determine that the substance actually had self-replicating properties and it had been left in the earth any longer, it would have completely entombed the craft. Our lieutenant colonel, friend, thought we might be able to use something similar on our own spaceships to prevent damage, but the process of making it was very complicated. I could never get a straight answer from anybody on how to do it. The stuff was also very magnetic, attracting to metal objects. It would have been impossible to keep them on our own ships. The colonel thought maybe this might be deterrent, which the aliens, or the alien life, to use to prevent damage. I knew enough about their weapons by then to know they would never let something like this get in the way of them achieving their objectives. The research for the project was eventually moved to United States soil, under the name Project Mercury. I found out later that the craft had been orbiting our planet for years, supposedly, but it was only then when it began to get within range of some very powerful equipment in Antarctica, they were able to determine what exactly the source of the electromagnetic radiation coming from it was. From the time spent in the dirt, it had somehow managed to find a way to biomutate and produce uh, this sort of energy source, a unique energy source. They later found out that it was half the life decay of one element into another, which typically happens slowly but more rapidly in space, apparently. When they pulled it out of the ground, they could not figure out how to deactivate it, and such was towed away from the coast and placed in some international waters. I was told by somebody who worked on the project, that part of Antarctica where we were first detected, I was told that operations on this technology is still functioning today.